Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk about a market that has rallied into the close in a pretty dramatic fashion here on a Friday afternoon. Big earnings week with really capitulated uh, in the last 24 hours with all the FANG stocks essentially reporting and overall stocks uh, going higher. Some short-term movements, right? So stocks like Amazon opening higher, closing more to the lower end, but 100% across the board, certainly a positive vibe going into the weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Our goal with this show is to help you navigate these markets, help you make sense of the flickering ticks, the short-term fluctuations in the market, connect the short-term of every day, every minute with the long-term trends. Most of you watching I know are more longer-term investors or at the very least should have a proper long-term perspective, even if you're operating on the shorter term. And the goal with the show is to really focus on that uh, on that long-term time frame, how it evolves day-to-day, uh, -day, week to week. But so often, it's easy to get caught up in the uh, you know short-term movements, and there's a thing called uh, short-termism, or um, well, I'm totally blanking on the behavioral name for this, uh, but it's a uh, it's basically a, a nearsightedness. You see a lot of movements, you uh, you get caught into short-term decisions, and you never want to make long-term decisions using short-term data. So. Let's get, to, uh, let's get to the recap. First though, I wanted to mention some of the upcoming events we have on the show. We had such great guests uh, this week. Larry Berman was a, was a fascinating guest yesterday um, talking about infrastructure plays during uh, going into an election season, what next year might hold uh, here in the US, especially with materials. Uh, next week, we have some fantastic guests as well. Andrew Thrasher is gonna be on the show on Tuesday. He's from Thrasher Analytics. And then Wednesday, Gary Dean from Sentiment Timing. Dot com. We're always looking for new guests, by the way. So if you have any suggestions, just shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We'll uh, happy to approach anyone that you want to uh, get them on the show. Let's get to our uh, market recap. And really on Fridays, we wrap the week. And what that means is we look at the uh, long term and how the picture has changed Friday to Friday. What's the evolution in these trends? And, and the S&P certainly finishing in a position of strength today, right? The S&P up uh, to around 3271. So a decent way to finish the, uh, the week. It wasn't as high uh, earlier in the day. It was really finishing more or, or midday was around 3220. Um, and then you can see it rallied really uh, accelerated into, uh, into the close. So certainly some optimism going into, uh, into the weekend here. Interesting to note where the movements were. If you go outside of that large cap growth space uh, with the overweight in tech communication services, pretty much everything else was kind of flat to down, if not, uh, if not down in a pretty meaningful way. Uh, small caps uh, finished the day down 0.7%, mid caps down 0.6%. Again, earlier in the day, these were all down a lot more. A lot of that movement came uh, in the uh, in the last uh, last half of trading for sure. Uh, the NASDAQ 100 certainly leading the way higher with technology, the number one sector up 2.5%. So, you know, this week, besides the Fed meeting, which I think ended up just being sort of a non-event, I think everything that they had said has sort of been priced in. There weren't any real surprises there. Um, you know, the, uh, the tech companies uh, um, speaking in front of Congress, a congressional hearing, I don't know how much that moved the needle. I think the earnings releases and how we digested that is really the story and how things sort of uh, evolved going into, uh, into the weekend here. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. Actually, forget that. We're going to go right to the Mindful Investor Live chart list again on a, on a uh, Friday. We like to wrap the week means we're looking at the big picture trends how they've evolved. We'll start with the S&P 500 long-term trend following model. And this hasn't changed really uh, since last week. This remains long-term bullish, medium-term bullish, short-term bearish. And, and the way that that's, uh, again, the way that I'm interpreting that is the long-term trend, what I think is like the you know multi-year trend, the secular trend is based on the weekly PPO using the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages. That remains uh, positive, as long as it's above zero, that's in a, uh, in a positive place. The medium term trend is defined by the weekly PPO using the traditional settings that turned positive in May and remains positive 
to now the short term uh, is based on the difference between those two moving averages, sort of the histogram that is part of the MACD or the PPO indicators. That's been bearish just for the last two weeks. And again, that just represents that short term weakness within the long term trend, which is about how it feels for the S&P overall. Uh, as well as for as for the uh, as for the broader market, you know, here looking at the daily chart, you can see how uh, you know we sort of rallied up to finish uh, closing more at the uh, at the highs of the day. Uh, that's that's where we're at here around 3270. So just in the short term, just in the last two weeks, we've established a sort of uh, mini range, you might call it, uh, between 3200 on the low side. Uh, around 3280 or so, which was the peak from uh, from last week. So, you know, we sort of have this uh, short term congestion area, which is right about at the June high. So if you think about it, we have attempted to break above the June highs. We have not been able to follow through it again today. We have now closed above uh, 3250. I, I would want to see some follow through. So, again, every time we close above a key resistance level, we haven't gotten the follow through yet. That's what I would be looking for into next week if we do that. I think that clears the way for uh, for much higher higher highs. The the, uh, the the rally going into the close certainly changes the look of this uh, of this week finishing stronger uh, for sure. Finishing at the high point for the week again, not quite eclipsing uh, the the finish for last week. The the underlying or the maybe overlying thesis to keep in mind, however, is the bearish divergence with higher highs in the price, lower peaks in the RSI. That really hasn't changed. I think that's still in play. And again, what that tells you is the uptrend is in play. The uptrend is maturing, I guess, is how I would think of it. It's not necessarily for me telling you to sell or telling you to go in cash, or telling you to get really nervous. It tells you to be aware, similar to what you saw in February. If you want to be really aggressive, you could you know, be, you know, take a position, a short position, and then just have a really tight stop or something like that. For me, I'm much more interested in uh, a confirmation, a, a, an indication that an uptrend is over. The bearish divergence puts it on my list. The breakdown in price is what tells, tells you it's actually happening. So for me, 3,200 would have to uh, be broken first. And below that, it's really about the 50-day moving average, which lines up those swing lows from July around 3130, 3150 or so. The next chart in our, uh, in our weekly list here is looking at breadth. And this is what I think tells a little longer term story of what we saw today. Today, if you looked during the day, anything uh, tilted toward large cap growth was doing okay to pretty well. Anything else, anywhere else in the style box of the nine, uh, the nine quadrants are using, that's no, not quadrants, but nine, the nine parts of the box from, you know, growth to value and small to large, pretty much everything else was in the, uh, in the red, uh, you know, midday. And that showed you how narrow it was uh, with the leadership coming from the largest names. The breadth picture, I think, sort of confirms that. Uh, you can see the long-term cumulative advanced decline lines in the S&P 500 remaining positive. If you look at the New York Stock Exchange, look at the mid cap index, look at the small cap index, they're all what I would consider neutral. They haven't broken above the July high, or excuse me, the June highs just yet, whereas the S&P already has. June, the S&P has actually broken above the February high. So there are a lot of ways to calculate advanced decline lines. This is how I've tended to do it. And until you see these continuing a pattern of higher highs and higher lows, I think it's um, sort of a, uh, a wait and see mode there. We have had a consistent number of new highs in the month of July, and that, that's wrapping up today. Obviously, we'll, we'll start August on Monday. So, you know, if you look at the month of July versus the month of June, certainly an increased number of new highs on the S&P 500, an increased number on the broader New York Stock Exchange. That's all fairly constructive. And as we've talked about before, a, a, an uptrend has legs or has the potential to continue on if you have this, uh, these numbers going higher because if the market goes higher and these numbers remain muted, that just means it's a small, narrow number of stocks doing all the gains. These lines going higher, these histograms going higher, tells you more and more individual stocks are breaking to new 52-week highs, meaning they're eclipsing their highs from back here like the S&P has not done. The, the, this indicator continuing to go higher told, tells you it's a measure of breadth suggesting how many stocks are along with those uh, mega cap names that have already done so if they're participating on the upside as well. I, you know, said in a public forum, including the show, if this indicator, the percent of stocks above their 200-day gets above 50%, which it did a couple weeks ago, once that happens, I have to assume that the path of least resistance is higher. I've, I've, I've revisited that many times in the last couple of weeks, and I stand by that. I, I certainly recognize the uptrend is in place. Now over half of stocks in the S&P are above their 200-day moving averages. That's good. That's what an uptrend uh, should feel like. And if you look back over time, that's what uptrends have looked like. That number remaining above 50%, I think, would continue to validate that 
uh, that bullish thesis. If and when that gets below 50%, that would be uh, an indication for me to revisit that and, and think about potential downside. So, you know, I think the good news for the S&P is you have breadth measures that are either neutral to positive. You have things like this that have a clear line that you would agree to revisit it. You have clear support levels below where we're at around 3,200, maybe the first first stop on that on that train. You know, if we start breaking those levels, I think you can start uh, being a little more concerned than you need to be now. Interesting move in the AAII rankings this week. And again, I don't like to drive this home too much only because I find sentiment is sort of the third in importance. Starts with price, second is breadth, third is sentiment. Because price tells me what the market is doing. What are people voting with their capital, with their money? The breadth tells me the characteristics of that and sees if I can qualify what I'm seeing with price by what stocks are actually moving up and down. Sentiment is a little more softer and, and fluffier, right? This is a little more what people are saying they're going to do. Price tells you what they've actually done. So that's why I, I, I put it third in importance behind price and breadth, but it's still an important data point and something that leads me to dig into price uh, levels maybe a little more deeply. So interesting to note on the AAII rankings, the spread between bulls and bears is pretty low. I'm sorry, it's, pre it's pretty, pretty strong to the downsides. The lowest it's been, the only other time it's been this low in the last five years uh, was May, which was sort of this pullback on the uptrend, uh, the December market low in 2018, and the end of the 2015-16 uh, cyclical pullback in stocks. So we're, we're right back at, a, at an extreme spread between bulls and bears. So there's, it's over a two to one ratio. It's kind of two and a half to one right now, uh, bears versus bulls. So uh, bullish votes down to 20%. Bearish votes almost to 50%, and in downtrends, you start to see 50% readings on, uh, on that indicator. This is a performance look at consumer discretionary versus staples. I think we've talked about some of these. I don't want to hit on all these, but I just want to hit on a couple key points. You know, this ratio is starting to, to favor consumer discretionary, it's starting to me to lean, you know, to think about the, uh, you know, uh, technology leadership and what would take its place in a, if technology started to taper off. This week certainly saw rotations back into technology shares. This ratio turning back lower, favoring tech over consumer discretionary. Again, until we break above this 1.3 level, which would be a new swing high for that ratio, it's telling you tech is still a, a pretty decent place to be. The relative performance in semiconductors remains very positive. Again, confirming the, uh, the strength in that bellwether group. This ratio is actually really interesting. This is small caps versus uh, large caps in the form of the IWM versus the SPY, the Russell 2000 ETF versus the S&P 500 ETF. I think it's worth noting this was in a huge downtrend to the March lows, a nice uptrend since the March lows. That changed mid-June when you saw sort of a change of character, a lower peak, and we broke down through uh, trend line support. Since then, what's happened is uh, it's now sort of chopped around. And, and, and a lot of measures we would look at, I, I'm, I can't remember if the chart I wanna show is on here next, I'll see it in a second, but there are a number of other measures that are sort of, uh, sort of choppy to sideways, sort of gives you a, a number of false breakouts and breakdowns. And I think this small cap versus large, you could arguably put in that bucket. Overall, you know, you know, force me to pick a decision on which way. I would probably say this is leaning away from small caps and into large caps. And I do that because it's a pattern of lower highs and lower lows until that changes. I think it's favoring, you know, certainly favoring large over small. Um, but it's interesting to see how it's sort of in this choppy, head fakey kind of environment. The other chart that that reminds me of is high beta versus low vol, which I think is on here. Here we go. This is a chart we've looked at. You know, this is the outperformance of high beta versus low volatility since the March. Uh, 2020 low. This is that pullback since the June market high. You can see how it was favoring uh, low vol as a group versus high beta. Since then, it's essentially been sideways. So it's sort of, you know, an equilibrium point, which again, this is what the S&P has sort of felt like. It had the big run out of the March lows, the peak in June, and now it's sort of been choppy. It's been, it's been more range bound than anything. So these kind of ratios, small versus large, high beta versus low vol, I think there's a movement to come here. And I think which way these sort of charts break will, will help, hopefully would help you understand that idea of um, risk on versus risk off and where uh, investors are sort of leaning. I did want to finish off, we sort of hit on that, uh, that, that group of charts pretty, pretty heavily. I just wanted to finish off looking at a couple non-equity asset classes just to revisit uh, where things are at. Uh, we talked about bonds earlier in the week. We had our segment uh, uh, clipping coupons. I think that was Wednesday. I, I, I'm not entirely certain which day it was, but 
Uh, you know, we looked a little in a little more depth. We don't have time to get too much into it, but I did want to point out the TLT remains in a decent uptrend, 10-year yields, uh, making potentially a new all-time low here, um, you know, really continuing to come in. We're continuing to see lower yields, higher bond prices, and that's essentially across the board. But if the chart of the TLT is the main one I look at, again, as when I talk about bond prices going higher, I have a lot of people telling me why that shouldn't happen. And, and all I try to do is just point at the chart. You can tell me whatever you want about what should not happen. This is, this is, is what happen, is, is happening, right? So, so bond prices are going higher. Until that changes, I have to assume that that's going to go. There is a theoretical limit to the extent of that going up, but we're not there yet, I don't think. Gold is another one, and gold certainly has had a pretty exceptional week with the gap higher on the GLD, and this week really uh, finishing more on the, uh, on the positive side. The GLD was up almost 1% again today. So, you know, as we've talked about, I think as a long-term play, gold, precious metals certainly um, bear some consideration. Larry Berman on the show yesterday made a, a decent case uh, looking at an inflation-adjusted uh, gold price as well. That is our weekly wrap, trying to hit on all the long-term themes and where they've gone. And certainly, again, S&P finishing in a position of strength, bonds and gold also finishing strong. And that my concern going into next week is how sustainable is that with bonds, stocks, gold all going higher. One of those has to give, I would assume, next week. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It is such a pleasure to do the show with you every day. And I've gotten such great feedback from many of you and, you know, compliments about the show, um, compliments about guests, suggestions for guests, but questions that we love to answer. So as a reminder, two ways to get feedback and particularly questions to us. One is on email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. Second way is on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. If you're checking this out on YouTube, just put a comment below the video. We'll review all of those and answer as many questions as we can get to during the show. Question number one for the final bar mailbag today. My question is on Yeti, dollar sign Y-E-T-I. Let's bring that guy up. Uh, da, da, da. That's not it, sorry. Here we go. Uh, Mary Ellen has flagged this stock in her email digest. That's uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal. I like the technicals, would love your take even more. The implied volatility is higher than the S&P, well, which you know, affects uh, options premium through covered calls. Totally fair. So you know, Yeti is a, is a fantastic chart. And, and again, from a pure technical perspective, it, it's, it's in a consistent uptrend. Higher highs, higher lows. I like that. You, know, you look at so many stocks that have struggled around their January, February highs, a lot of sectors in that position. Yeti is having nothing of it, just continuing to go higher. You know, the, the RSI has been overbought a number of times, but I, I think this is where people get caught on the wrong side of RSI. This, is a, this basically tells you what the price has done. And if the stock is going higher in a consistent uptrend, you'll find things become overbought and remain overbought. It'll, it'll come overbought in, in the upswings and it'll pull back a little bit, it'll keep going. And that's actually, you know, what a good growth name in an explosive growth sort of phase technically would, would sort of look like. So I wouldn't be scared of that. I wouldn't be afraid of that. Um, the relative strength is what tells probably the most meaningful story from the first week in April. It's up, you know, 60 odd plus percent probably on a relative basis relative to the S&P. So the challenge with any name like this is just how overextended might it be, right? At some point, the music stops and things have to pull back a little bit. I'm not seeing signs of that yet. So, uh, you know, as a trend follower, you assume this sort of trend continues. For me, this is the time when you start bumping stops up. So, I mean, 40 is such a perfect line in the sand right now with the July low, with the 50-day moving average. If it would pull back last week, or excuse me, next week, um, that's certainly where I would be looking for some, uh, for some support. And as long as it remains above there, it, it, it's in a good uptrend. If it would start breaking down through that sort of level, I would be, uh, I would be concerned a little bit about uh, potential downside. I'd, I'd think of taking some, some of that off. But uh, overall, in a, in a pretty good shape. Again, it has a bearish divergence like so many charts do, but that shouldn't scare you out of it. That's something to pay attention to. And, and, and what for me, that tells you update your stops, make sure it's a good 
amount, a good level of risk that you're uh, open to taking, and uh, and overall you're in uh, you're in good shape. That, that's a great chart, I think. Question number two, I enjoy your daily market wrap. I'm an equity portfolio manager. Find your analysis very helpful. Thank you so much for that. I have a question about stocks such as Amazon, which are really far above their 200 day moving average. Um, and you're, you're, you're spot on with that. How does one set a stop loss or decide when to lighten up given that the stock would have to drop 30% just to get back to its uh, 200 day moving average? This is relevant as most institutional investors who are outperforming the market right now are overweight these and uh, overweight these overbought mega caps, cap stocks. Your, your question it has a lot of knowledge in there. So uh, thank you for having a good awareness of what is, what, is, what is at work here. You know, when I introduced the behavioral concept of uh, herding, which is basically we all herd into a certain position, I used an example of fi Facebook a number of years ago. You know, Facebook, one of the biggest stocks in the S&P 500, in a, in a strong uptrend, outperforming consistently. And my point and why herding, I think, happens on a massive level in those mega cap names is because if you're a portfolio manager, if you're an institutional money manager and you're benchmarked to the S&P 500, it's not a question as to whether or not you can own a stock like that. You have to own it because it is a huge name, a huge weight in your benchmark. And if you don't own it, you have such a performance hole to try and uh, dig out of. So there's a career risk in not owning the big MAGA names, the big FANG names uh, right about now. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. What concerns me, right, I think where hurting ends is when this starts to roll over, all of a sudden there's a huge risk with, with remaining in that position if it's a huge benchmark name and it's underperforming. And I thought that might be starting to happen uh, here this first, second week in July as you had the move away from those names. Some other uh, sectors are starting to do well. That didn't materialize. We sort of went right back to them. But at some point, there will be a rotation away from these. And I think you could see those accelerate very, very quickly as people get uh, people get nervous and, and, and don't want to be in a an underperforming uh, mega cap name when it uh, when it's when it's struggling on a relative basis. Overall, though, I, I think that the 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 risk of that is relatively low only because these are names that so many people are comfortable owning, especially in a defensive environment. They they've uh, you know big tech names and, and stocks like Amazon have essentially been a good defensive play. This is its relative performance, you know, February to March when everything was pretty much uh, getting crushed and outperformed pretty, uh, pretty handling. So your question, and so sorry, I just started getting excited about that. How do you deal with it being so far from the 200 day moving average? So I think it's a question of the long-term trend, which overall has been positive with all these charts versus the short-term tactical trend. I think the distance from the 200 day tells you more the tactical read on when to accumulate positions in a longer term trend. And that's how I would use it with institutional investors, right? The, the, the trend, the trend lines, the moving averages, the uh, relative strength tells you the long-term trend. You want to be with things that are outperforming. That's the general thesis. But when it's really far away from its 200 day, the question is, is that the right day to be adding to a winning position? And I would argue not so much. You wait for some sort of pullback and that's where you would uh, start to build a position. So waiting for the 200 day, I think, you know, in terms of risk, I'm not a big fan of that. For something like Amazon, all these, they've very nicely given you some, some pretty decent short-term support. So 2,900, I think, is a really good starting point. The 50-day moving average, a lot of these, you can see the, the, the recent swing low and the 50-day are all right about in that same area. I think stocks start to break down through their 50 days, down through those swing lows. That's where I would be a little more concerned than I would be now. Um, let's see. I purchased the book, The Visual Investor. Um, that's... Um, uh, John Murphy, if I remember right, uh, and I've enclosed on pay. Well, I even took a, a cell phone shot of the book. That's awesome. How do I generate this chart of the cumulative advanced decline index? Yeah, and the, and the chart is just showing the NYSE advanced decline line. Yeah, so there are a couple different ways to do it. The way that it works on stock charts, all of those are, uh, are tickerized, and it's a question of finding the right ticker and then uh, creating the correct uh, chart. That's sort of the way you want to do it. So the way that I do it is, uh, is using these. There are a couple ones, a dollar sign NYAD is the one that's in the book. Um, I use uh, exclamation point AD line SPX, AD line NYC. Those are cumulative indexes that we already create. You could also do dollar sign NYAD and down here, you'd say price, put in the ticker, and then over here where it's a style, change it from line to cumulative. And on any indicator, that'll actually create a cumulative indicator and, uh, and start 
start the clock when you start the chart and show you how that value has, uh, has changed. So for things that are more noisy, like advanced or decliners, which are gonna be up and down pretty quickly, you can turn any series into a cumulative series just by switching that setting. And actually the, the entire chart, you can change the style of the chart from uh, type solid line or bar chart to switch the type to cumulative and it'll uh, start the clock that way. That's all the time we have for questions, but boy, I, I mean, there's so many we didn't even get to that I will we'll keep on the list and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Thank you guys so much for sending in some very thoughtful questions. We need to move right on to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P market trend. This is something we look at every Friday. It's part of my process of just, you know, recalibrating to the long-term trend. The reason why we're starting with this is as things have gotten choppy, as we've had pullbacks in some of the mega cap names, rallying into the close today, heavy earnings, you know, the, tr you know, the key thing you can go back to besides speculation of what's going to happen around the election season, what's going to happen with infrastructure spending, what's going to happen with uh, mega cap names and, you know, Congress breaking up, uh, you know, with antitrust, uh, whatever it is, any of those things that we, I could make up at the moment, the trend is the trend, and that's based on price and where buyers and sellers have come up, uh, come together and agreed on a price. So focusing on the trend and using that as a lens with which, which you can consume other information, I think can be really, really powerful and help to simplify how other uh, information can be, can be used. So as a reminder, the long-term trend, the medium-term trends remain very positive. That's been in place since you know, sort of uh, the April to May to June timeframe based on the, the tools that I use until that changes the, the, the weight of the evidence overall still leaning positive until proven otherwise the trend is, uh, is higher. Chart number two is looking at the breadth. There are a lot of different ways to try to think about breadth and how it's been, uh, it's been affected. But I would point out that, uh, you know, the main way that I do it is looking at the advanced decline lines for the S&P and then the other cap tiers, mid caps and small caps in particular. And, you know, I think in some ways this is descriptive because it tells you the character of this market. There's no doubt on a day like today that the mega cap tech consumer communication services names were the catalyst to push things higher. Um, these indicators tell you more about the average stock or the equal weighted version. You know, it's great that the mega cap names are doing well. What are all the other stocks doing? This kind of helps you answer that question. So part one is it's descriptive. It tells you that it's been led by a relatively smaller number of the mega cap stocks. But what it also tells you is when uh, you, you may be uh, validated by these mid caps and small cap names uh, joining the party and, uh, and going higher. Can the market go meaningfully higher without small caps? Of course. Can it go higher without mid caps? Of course. The S&P is the S&P and it's all about that index and how it's calculated and so much is focused on that. But for me, I feel a lot better about an uptrend when this is not happening. When you see, you know, the, the large mega cap stocks doing one thing and you see everything else making lower highs. That's what concerned me in mid to late February. That's what potentially concerns me now, especially if you would start to get a breakdown in any of these, uh, in any of these breadth measures. But for now, positive on the S&P, neutral for the other, uh, other indexes. The final chart on the three and three is the uh, technology sector, the XLK. And as a reminder, this thing continues to go higher. And, and, you know, again, there's so much speculation you can make about what could happen, about what the future might hold. We had our charting the second half event, trying to anticipate the second half of the year. And for me, that's fine. And I think that's a great exercise to go through, especially thinking about different potential scenarios and what that might mean for your positioning, might mean for your portfolio. That's a really good exercise to go through at any point. But in terms of what actually drives your decisions, I hope it's, faced, it's based on the weight of the evidence and it's based on the trends and it's based on what's actually happening. The chart of the XLK is showing me that people are still leaning into technology. I think if the market would suffer, it certainly seems like it's reasonable that, uh, that people would be going into technology as a safe haven until something like the XLK breaks down through 104, breaks down through the 50 day. And this is why I feel like I've said that combination about a hundred times today. All of these things, the XLK included, have a pretty clear short-term support, in this case around 104, has the 50 day moving average right about at the same level. A lot of names are like that. If they all hold those on a pullback next week, for example, I think we're overall in good shape. We continue to build momentum to S&P 3400, if not higher. If stocks start to break down through that, that's when I would start to be concerned. So I think the XLK, if you're gonna look at anything, it's not a bad thing to uh, be paying attention to. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much. That's a wrap for the week on uh, The Final Bar. As a reminder, get us all your questions, all your feedback, The Final Bar at stockcharts.com or on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. 
For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great weekend. See you next week. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.